Okay, so this is a special edition, Mark only episode on meditation and trauma. Uh, why am I doing this episode? Well, we have a course starting on meditation today. Should be the day this was released on Tuesday, the 14th of March, 2023, and on um, trauma on Wednesday, the 15th. Two different courses. Uh, Karin, Colleen Van Manen, my colleague, is leading the course on the 14th. I'm leading the trauma coaching course on the 15th. So um, I thought rather though than sort of just an advert, it's kind of boring, isn't it? Um, I do like a personal story. So um, this is my personal journey around meditation and trauma um, and kind of how they fit together. Just so, you know, there's two topics there. I talk about either one for a long, long time. But um, yeah, two topics and how they fit together. So I'm going to tell my sort of personal story. And I think some things in here will be interesting to draw out. Um, if you are interested in training with us, of course, Body Meditation Teacher Training starts today. Uh, go to embodimentunlimited.com for all the details on that. If you don't get the newsletter um, and trauma coaching, you have to message me. So you have to message me through Instagram, Mark Walsh, um, uh, or through my Facebook. Um, it's a sort of application process that is a bit trickier. I'm sort of handling it personally just because it's a small group and I want to make sure people are on that course are uh, really good fit. It's not like one of our big mass courses. Um, so that's all going on. So that's why I thought I would do a podcast. Okay, so um, I first tried to meditate many, many years ago. I was probably still a teenager and I couldn't do it. And by, by that, I don't mean I did it and, you know, wasn't enlightened or something. I mean, I, I, I couldn't sit still. Uh, I had massive, what I would now understand as hyperarousal symptoms from trauma, uh, which is pretty common. It's pretty common. And um, the idea of sort of sitting still was it's just impossible for me, just totally impossible. Um, so, yeah, my first attempt at meditation, particularly I was self-medicated with alcohol at that time. And I, I just... When I say I wasn't successful, again, I don't mean that I didn't get sort of bliss states or totally clear my mind. You know, a lot of people have this sort of myth that they have to clear their mind. I knew that wasn't the case. It was just crazy making. It was like a fucking box of frogs, you know? Um, and that's most people's experience to some extent of meditation anyway. But for me, it was just just impossible, just impossible to meditate um, while I was alcoholic and while I had sort of untreated, untreated trauma. Interesting. Now, I first got sober, um, let's see, what, we're 17 plus years ago? I've lost track a lot of years ago now. And um, immediately after getting sober, I was like, oh, my God, because I'd taken away that medication. And at that point, I was like, right, I should really try, you know, and I managed for like 10 minutes a day. And uh, I was given some help by Paul Linder, and he gave me some sort of different techniques that I could work with, which would be sensitive to that, that would involve my mind a bit more, um, that weren't quite so strict, as it were. And uh, also doing it after a keto practice. I'd done Aikido for a few years, and doing a sort of real physical art to burn off some of that charge was so helpful to me. Like, I, I see, you know, a lot of people do martial arts and yoga who uh, find meditation very difficult. And that's great. The problem with that, of course, is that those the stimulus of those things, someone attacking you or a strong stretch in many yogis' cases, uh, makes it easier. But that's also the problem because we don't have that stimulus generally in life, right? So the reason meditation is difficult is also the reason why it's more applicable because in life, you're always there, you're breathing, you're in your body, whatever. Um, but you're not always like stretching or being attacked or something, you know, doing tantra or something that might be more of an intense stimulus. So when people say to me, like, hey, skiing's my meditation, I'm like, no, it's not. Yeah, skiing's a way of forcing mindfulness, but it's not um, mindfulness in the truest sense because you're not directing it, it's being forced. Yeah. So anyway, forced mindfulness through um, um, Aikido was a real good gateway for me, though certainly a good way in. And then when I did get sober, I was really using the meditation. Uh, you know, I was doing things like cold showers to help me out again with my arousal levels. And some sort of trauma treatment from Paul Linden kind of made it possible for me, at least in the first instance. Um, you know, if my trauma was sort of a one to 10, maybe it was, you know, an eight, and he got it down to like a six. So it was just about bearable. I did my 10 minutes a day, and I found it very helpful. And the nice thing was, you know, every day I'd meditate, I'd just go, I feel better, and it would get a bit easier like many things, there's a momentum, this habit, things do get a bit easier. 
um, after you know a few years of sort of meditating 10, 20 minutes a day, um, different different techniques, you know, I realized this is hey, this is a great basis for embodiment, which is becoming my career. That's very much the the perspective we take. I also saw what was like not very embodied, right? Like Kara and I've talked about this on previous podcasts. Like I did breath meditation for years, counting breath at the tip of my nose. And um, you're actually not feeling your entire body other than the tip of your nose when you do that. Okay. So not not great for embodiment. Um, also realizing breath meditation could be more full body, different types of body scanning, you know, different teachers I came across, Robert Bayer at Guy House. Actually, he was the first person I did a retreat with. So after a few years of meditating, my coach, the late great coach Watkins, who was a mentor as well, said, Hey, you might want to do a retreat. So like, okay, five days. It's a good amount of time for a first retreat. I wouldn't recommend like, you know, 10 day Vipassana as a first retreat. So Guy House, which for American listeners is a bit like sort of the British spirit rock, you know, insight meditation, basically Theravada influenced. And there's meta meditation, loving kindness meditation. And um, what they didn't tell me though, well, they probably did, but I probably didn't read the small print on the email, was that this meditation retreat was silent. I didn't know that was a thing. That might sound silly to listeners, but, you know, remember I hadn't been meditating long and, um, yeah, I didn't realize you had to be quiet the whole time. And I was bouncing off the walls. There was no touch either. And I basically still had quite a lot of trauma and I was self-regulating or regulating with touch and verbally, which is a very Irish cultural pattern, actually. Just like, burr, 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 you know, get it out of your system that way. I was just going to talk about your problems, but if you're used to doing that, then it's a bit of a problem where you can't, right? So all of a sudden, like, you know, I couldn't uh, do anything sexual. That was also banned. Um, I couldn't talk. That was many ways more important. And I wasn't getting much touch. Uh, I just, you know, I talked to Rob about this and he handled it really well. He was like, hey, is there anyone who's willing to give Mark a hug who isn't, you know, <laughs> turned on by him? And, uh, you know, I had these interviews which helped, you know, to at least discharge a little bit verbally. And it actually made me realize like how I was self regulating. I didn't realize that at the time. It's so pretty interesting to me. And also, I didn't realize like, how deep you could go. I thought, oh, meditation, it's kind of calming, it clears your mind a bit. You know, I'd had those sort of positive benefits already. You know, like a lot of people on the apps today doing 10 minutes, 20 minutes. And after, you know, five days of doing loving kindness meditation, um, I was just loving the universe. You know, I was in totally altered states, totally altered states. And um, very deep, even from five days. And certainly later on when I did sort of, you know, 10 days then intensives and had... Uh, kind of very oceanic or kind of oneness experiences as uh, so a retreat for Shins and Young where I had a lot of those experiences. I found certain things would bring them out, you know, obviously intensity in practice, I used to add fasting to that, the movement and embodiment practice to that. Um, what else? Uh, actually, interestingly, at Shinzen's practice, I um, where I probably had my deepest experiences. Um, I was getting, I was doing cold plunging every day and getting massaged every two days. There was a masseuse on site and I just booked myself in. You know, I was like, I had some money at the time. I was like, fuck it. It's very interesting that sort of physical side was there. I also, that was an interesting period because I did a two week intensive and I had two weeks off and another two week intensive. And the first two weeks intensive was really unpleasant with an organization I won't name, but certainly wouldn't recommend. And um, it was in the middle of nowhere in the Colorado mountains. And I was made to feel very unwelcome. And it was just a pretty unpleasant organization that's since imploded a little bit. And um, it was interesting going from a sort of very hostile environment, having two weeks off, and then going to a very friendly, open, accepting environment where the pressure was taken off a little bit, but still the practice was taken very seriously. That combination of that worked very well for me. <laughs> anyway, trauma, trauma. Uh, so... I found as I did trauma healing, so I was doing TRE and somatic experiencing type stuff and various other modalities, um, somatic, non-somatic, that actually meditation got a bit easier and the concentration aspect got a bit easier. Um, my attitude towards it became less intense. And the thing about trauma is it impacts your subtle attitudes, like coming at everything like a mission, everything's life and death, uh, everything's do or die, you know, plus also it comes to dissociation, which you're trying to get more deeply into your body isn't isn't the greatest right so there's this interesting relationship the trauma can get in the way of meditation but also you know meditation done intelligently done with compassion done with some trauma sensitivity like david chavella and his um wrote a book on this trauma sensitive mindfulness and he's a guest teacher actually on, on a course and um you know once i sort of realized the can bit of connection between the two um you know that really helped both my trauma healing and my meditation 
both were helped by understanding some of those connections of things like hyperarousal and numbing and those kind of things. Um, also, I did find that as I, you know, on, often on meditation retreats, as I relaxed, the kind of armoring that was holding the trauma, that was the trauma in many ways, would drop away. And often I would go through periods of one or two days on meditation retreats where I would just cry. You know, grief would come out. Profound healing would happen um, as a result of just like deeply, deeply letting go on levels that just aren't possible doing a few minutes a day. Um, you know, I kind of feel sad in some ways that mindfulness has become this like um, productivity hat or um, you know, even just wellness trend. It's just so much more than that. I think Kyra and he's definitely agree with me on that. Yeah, so while it's not sufficient um, and certainly done within hostile context, like sometimes happened to me, the sort of dropping away of layers, it's, it's almost like imagine a pond that looks quite serene and peaceful, but then as the water level drops, you realize it's full of Tesco shopping trolleys and dead bodies and skeletons or whatever. You know, it's kind of like that I found with meditation. I was forced to confront things. And there's also just nowhere to hide on meditation retreats. They're very intense environments in many ways. So, um, yeah, I had some good experiences with Zen, uh, with the Tibetan guys, mostly kind of Theravada and in monasteries. It's very interesting from a trauma point of view, actually staying in a monastery, because everything's kind of rigidly controlled. There's rules for everything, how you eat, when you sleep, how many meals a day you have. It's not like normal life. It's, it's sort of in some ways like spiritual prison, you know. There's so many rules. And that structure for many people with trauma can be, um, can feel good. It can feel like okay, the world's now predictable. It's more safe. You know, that's what's lost with trauma. Um, for me, I had a different trauma pattern. It can feel sort of horribly restrictive and I have to remind myself that I was choosing it, you know. And sometimes you see these kind of weird rebellious slash wanting rules kind of pa patterns in people with trauma as well. And that's definitely the case for me. Mm. Another thing is trauma can make human relationships quite difficult, uh, quite conflicted, difficulties with intimacy, with conflict, those kind of things. And, you know, it's very interesting to be on retreat and just have those taken away. Like, you know, to go, right, there's no sexual contact here. Um, <laughs> I think my very first retreat, I ended up hooking up with someone. Sorry about that. Not very ethical. Uh, <laughs> but soon realized that wasn't the point. Um and uh, so sexual intimacy is taken away. Sometimes talking is taken away, right? So it's just much easier to get on with people when you don't have to talk. And you also become aware of very subtle levels of interaction. You know, you're sitting by people, really enjoying their company, just eating a meal together in silence. Also, in solitary retreats, would not recommend that for someone with untreated trauma. I did this later on in my healing journey. Um, interesting, there's a book in the place that I do solitary retreats. And half the stories are heaven and half are hell and very little in between. And it's just what you bring in to a solitary retreat, you know. No matter how introverted you are, it's pretty difficult. Normally the first day or two, or maybe more if you're a super introvert, it's like, oh, what a relief to be away from it all. You know, no one looking at me. It's very interesting, our sort of social self or our trauma defense self, whether that be be nice or be aggressive, just isn't there, it drops away. And then you go, what's left? It's pretty interesting. Um yeah, and then there's this period of, you know, we're all co-regulated, so that's just taken away. Even if you're being a what I'd call eco-regulated at a nice retreat center somewhere or a nice little hut in the woods, as I do, uh, it's still pretty confronting. And unless you've got great self-regulation, I wouldn't necessarily recommend a solitary retreat. It's pretty, it's pretty hardcore. It's pretty hardcore. I know people have done darkness retreats and other things as well. And, um, you know, I always say with retreats, you know, start gently, five days, semi-silent. You know, I did one retreat that was like half talking in the afternoons, but not the mornings or whatever, you know, something like that. It's quite general. Um, yeah, so solitary retreat is an interesting one from a trauma point of view, but again, also very healing going, you know what, I don't have to have these patterns. I can be self-sufficient. Um, I don't have to be a certain persona that the kind of social defense brings out. So pretty interesting. Um, what can I say? Culturally, doing retreats in different places is pretty interesting, seeing different nationalities, you know, Asian kind of vibes, Tibetan, Japanese vibe of Zen, etc. That all brings up, I think, all confronts trauma in different ways. Um, yeah, so I guess that's that. These days, much more chill in how I approach meditation, um, different things for different people, you know, don't have that kind of like fundamentalism. This has saved me, so I must save you. Definitely found that trauma healing helps deepen the meditative practice. Um, love the embodied meditation approach that Karen and uh, myself have developed. I think that's, you know, it's really enriching, particularly if you want 
grounded meditation that really helps your actual life off the mat. That's something I think, you know, we're kind of specialists in. Uh, if you want that, look it up. Also, it's, it's very good for coaches. You know, a lot of coaches follow me and, and work with us. And it's a good set of meditation techniques as coaches you can give clients and how do you kind of get that establish their practice regularly that's the kind of thing we work with and the way uh, what i guess here's what i like about it body meditation which is deep without being esoteric it's deep without having to become a you know tibetan buddhist or signed up buddhist or whatever it's a deep approach it's not shallow secular mindfulness but it's not deep religious buddhism and i think that's that's much needed there's a, there's a few others in that space shins and young i've mentioned but not that many not that many yeah um, oh, I was thinking if I've covered the bases I wanted to when I was planning this in my head while having my dinner. I think we have. I think we have. Yeah. Okay. So a little bit of reflection. As I said, meditation has definitely helped my healing. Healing's definitely helped my meditation. Um, a few reflections there. I hope there's something useful there. Uh, do check out embodimentunlimited.com as ever. Again, if you're if you're if you're in the future where I expand next and you missed these courses, I'm terribly sorry. We may do them again next year. I probably won't be doing trauma coaching again next year, though, because I'm having a semi-sabbatical year. Uh, Karen will probably be doing embodied meditation again next year. Uh, if you're on a newsletter list, of course, you'll hear about those. Um, also, a free thing, if you haven't heard of it yet, uh, Embodiment Unlimited app. We've added a lot of content from the Embodiment Conference on there for free for everyone. Um, so have a look at the app. Um, the other thing that we're adding in just a few days' time um, on there is the studio where you can find for free, again, embodiment classes from around the world. You can find a class that's kind of the thing you like, whether it's 6 p.m. or 7 p.m., kind of style you want. You can see like star ratings where other people have said this class is great, giving it reviews. Yeah. And that is a huge gift, actually, to the embodiment world um, that you can get, you know, online classes in an app just there. You know, obviously, you might have to pay for the class itself, but we're not charging for it. We're not adding a percentage or anything. Think like Airbnb, but we're not charging anything for our services, um, which is fucking cool. I'm so proud of that. And it's it's super cool the techie guys have done it. We've been working on it for two years, actually, slowly two years since the conference. Um, so very proud of that. There's all sorts of other free stuff, um, podcasts and stuff like that on the app as well. So if you haven't downloaded that, it's available in, you know, the normal Play Shop, is it? App stores, blah, blah, blah. The Embodiment app, you'll find it. Um, and those courses have said, if, if you're not hearing this too late, uh, they're starting for the trauma coaching one. Oh, I didn't mention what that is. Um, so I've seen a gap. So um, a lot of people want to become therapists, but that could be three years of training. Also, therapy is really necessary if someone's like really messed up with trauma, like if someone's had quite severe trauma, if it's not yet well treated. But what I realize is that most people in the world have either a bit of trauma um, or they had severe trauma and now it's quite healed. It's like, you know, well on their way. Those people I've found can do well with coaching. So it's not therapy, going in the past, trying to heal them. It's more just giving them some tools, some resources. We have something called the superpowers technique, which is an awesome way of looking at trauma um, as a skills acquisition. Actually, it's a very positive, hopeful frame on trauma. Very original. Uh, I teach people that in actually just a few months. Um, they do have to have had some coaching and facilitation experience. I don't think newbies... They have to have those base skills uh, with me or with other people. They have to have some sort of self-regulation skills, like learn skills around breath work or yoga, something like that. Um, if you want to know, though, message me on Instagram or Facebook, uh, like today, today, because it starts tomorrow, um, and see if you're eligible. As I said, just taking a handful of people for that. We do have a few charity places, uh, sort of donation-based, much reduced in price if people are doing, you know, good work with trauma or it's one guy in Colombia I'm talking to or someone working with Ukrainian refugees, stuff like that. You know, we, we, we want to support people doing good stuff. Uh, so if that's you, we won't let money be a big barrier. Um, but you do still have to be suitable, you know, you know, not sort of deep in your own trauma process or not totally unequipped. Uh, yeah, okay, I think I've gone on for long enough and it's kind of late here. So um, that's me for today. Cheers, guys. Well, actually, if you like that, you'll probably like embodimentunlimited.com and our app. Um, so on both of these things, you can get a bunch of podcasts that aren't available here and some exclusive ones with some big names and people you'll probably recognize that are over there. Um, there's um, a copy of my book, a PDF of my first book on embodiment, which uh, seems to be people like. I sold quite a few copies on Amazon, but there's a free copy there. Um, what else is there? Loads of videos of me coaching embodiment, resources on trauma, on meditation, on yoga, 
And you can also chat to people without going on Facebook or any of that nonsense. Um, so if you want to chat embodiment with people, that's there. And it's on the embodimentunlimited.com, all free, and the app available at the App Store and all that good stuff. So if you like this, do check those out.